Namaste. It is wonderful to be here with everybody. And um, it's been already an exciting morning. We have a thrilling panel for you. I am honored to be joined by these esteemed panelists. They've all been introduced to you already. And um, we are going to have a wonderful conversation about oceans and blue, no, not blue, green, green shipping corridors. I'm going to start with Anusha. Um, because we really want to take the most of the time that we have. We don't want to, you know, spend it in introductions. You can read the introduction from your, from the program that's in front of you. So I'm going to dive right into it. Anusha, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Odi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as an urban sociologist, I think I'd like to write up front, bring to attention the role of port cities and coastal cities in the entire blue economy system. Um, not just as engines of economic growth, but I think as centers of rich culture, rich heritage, and most maritime economies have uh, thousands of years of heritage. So I'd like to bring to attention the role of that in the development of the blue economy system. Uh, and for something like that, I think it requires a people-first approach, um, a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, as we need to uh, look at generating employment and supporting trade in these cities. Uh, and this is going to be what I'm going to draw attention to in this panel. Uh, also, most importantly, I think uh, the other thing that we were discussing a while ago with Yodi and uh, Yodi brought to attention about how um, port cities and coastal cities of the global south can emerge as thought leaders uh, to bring um, a, an innovative model into place where we um, have sustainable port city development to look at cities as not just centers of uh, drivers of economic growth, but also as centers of para diplomacy. Thank you very much, Anusha. So we're talking about how the economies of India and the African continental free trade area, basically Africa, will both approach five trillion in the coming years. Um, to do that, there are certain things that need to happen. So I'm going to go to Ruben um, to talk up to us about shipping channels. Ruben from Portugal. Thank you, Yodi. Uh, so, um, at the moment, uh, it is not due to uh, climate change uh, and environmental challenges, but also to the necessity and, and the ultimate need of diversifying sources of energy uh, for uh, for the ship for the shipping industry and ports. Uh, the adoption of clean fuels like hydrogen, uh, ammonia, or others, and also electricity is being considered uh, an option, but also the comeback of wind propulsion, even into container ships. So adopting and inserting the rigid sails uh, with technology that comes from the airline industry, again, to the container, to the contain, uh, container ships. This seems far-fetched, but it is already happening on the ground. And this means that the, if, by one way, the transportation will be cleaner, another way, or can be cleaner, the energy density of that, of the new options, is much lower than the conventional, the conventional fossil fuels. So this means that it, is, it will be needed to have more efficiency in the, in the vessels, but also it will mean the need for more stopovers along the way for refueling the ships. So this means that if you consider the position uh, and geographical position at the potential and also the market potential of the, of India and its position as a rimland of uh, of the heartland of Asia, Europe is also a real one of the heart, heart of Asia. And there is a, a huge market, it's called Africa, that has a lot of potential if we are able to design a shipping route that has these characteristics uh, of cleaner and also that enhances local production. So hydrogen needs to be locally produced. Uh, preferably using renewables. 
So the sub-Saharan Africa is very abundant in natural resources that are available for producing hydrogen in a sustainable way. So if we have a green shipping corridor between India, Africa, and the European Union and Europe, that will enhance trade along the way. It will enhance uh, the local economies in a high value, high value chain, because the hydrogen, as I said, has to be locally produced and then locally stored and then for refueling the ships. And also for the repair and maintenance, because these, you know, uh, new sh uh, this kind of vessels will need, will have more apparatus and that will have, will, uh, you know, uh, grow the need of having better you know, a local, uh, local support for this, uh, for this uh, new, new technology, new, new type of vessels. And also uh, uh, the digital part. This uh, has to be done in integration with artificial intelligence applications and geospatial applications for connecting, you know, to satellites or optimizing the routes, but also the advanced vessel dynamics so that you can optimize the route and, and the energy usage. So without you know, going, I would say, deeper into technical details, just to give some numbers. The European Union is the largest trade, par trade partner of India. And 8%, 80% of that trade is done by ocean. So if we are able between uh, our, uh, uh, our two uh, subcontinents to do a shipping corridor that uh, catalyzes the development of the uh, sub-Saharan African economies and, and also the North African economies, that will have a huge impact because it will grow economy without you know, destroying ecology and restoring ocean health. Well, thank you very much, Ruben. You've raised some very interesting points there. You talk about, you know, Europe being Africa's late largest trading partner um, and the linkage between India, Africa and Europe. Um, you know, you talk about the potential in, in Africa and the possibilities. I, I always like to talk about the potential and the possibilities. Um, we'll get into a little bit later. I'd love to hear a little bit more about this artificial intelligence and, and how that works. Maybe that's a sub, a sub to topic, but we talk about Africa, my beloved continent. We talk about Africa and the huge market potential. We talk about Africa, which we pray and hope will be the next rising giant of the future. And as you spoke, I also, um, it came to mind some of the words of the ministers, um, as he spoke earlier, talking about tourism and ports and inland waterways sort of were coming to mind. But as you speak about linkages between Europe and Africa, I want to go to Africa. I want to go to my brother, um, Jeffrey, and ask him about, you know, I would imagine some of that green corridor would pass through Kenya and would, you know, it would include Lamu and Mombasa and some of your ports. What is going on in Kenya? You talk about new ports being developed and being built. Um, how are we in Africa preparing? Um, because you speak not just to Kenya, but to the wider African continent. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much for having me. I am delighted to be part of this panel and this great conversation which is taking place here in India. Now, uh, going straight into the question, as you all know, the location of Africa is, is very strategic, both to Europe and uh, Asia. We are actually an island continent. We are surrounded by water. And so whether you're in the northern part of Africa, you have the Mediterranean Sea, the western part of Africa, you have the Atlantic Ocean, up to the southwest, and then East Africa, where I am located, you have, we have Western Indian Ocean. Now for us to, we as Africa, uh, there is already a platform that has been created by the African Union through the Africa Continental Free Trade Area which is uh, in totality when it's going to be fully implemented, will be um, targeting a market of 1.3 billion people. 
And, uh, and so that is a very huge opportunity which lies in the African continent. But uh, also, and, and as we speak about that, we, you know, we all know that ports are uh, gateways to international trade. In Kenya, we have the port of Mombasa, which is, which is one of the biggest ports in Africa. And uh, we have another port called the Port of Lamu, which is a newer port. Then in our neighboring country of Tanzania and others like Mozambique, South Africa, and also in West Africa, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, and also in North Africa, Mar Morocco, we have also Djibouti. All these ports are important ports and also the port of Alexandria in Egypt. These are very important ports for us. Now, it happens that we, we are embracing integration at a time when decarbonization is becoming a big agenda and therefore we have to modernize our ports. A port like the port of Mombasa now, we have to make it a green port as we expand it. We also, for the newer ports which are under construction, we must fully make them uh, green ports. And also, uh, because we have huge potential in renewable energy sources in Africa. I'll say that in my country, up to 70, I mean, up to 70 percent of our power source is, uh, is uh, actually from renewable energy sources. So then, what, how, do we, how do we tap into this potential? We must first ensure that uh, we connect every part of Africa, adopt the multimodal forms of transport, uh, whether it is air, rail, road, roads rather, and ensure, that, and also the sea, and ensure that we are really fully connected. Once that, is, that has happened, we can also be able to connect with the other neighboring continents, uh, like West Asia, and then India, we, it, it takes a very short time for you to get from Kenya to India and also Europe. And uh, this will require heavy and massive investment in infrastructural development. And therefore, we will need additional resources. And uh, as I look at Africa, any new infrastructure that must happen now has to be financed through largely uh, PPPs um, <clears throat> yeah, because uh, that is the only way we can get large projects uh, developed uh, in, within, within our continent. And secondly is uh, also to look into regional uh, financial institutions like Africa Development Bank and other institutions like Asian, Asian Investment Bank here, you have the European bank and see if also we can partner with those institutions so that we can develop the infrastructure that is needed for the future. I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you, you raised the issue of finance at the, at the end there, and I'd like to delve into that a little, a little later. Um, but you, you make some, you know, it's really interesting because as we try to travel across Africa, it's even within Africa, it's really often easier to fly to Europe. To, that, than it is to fly from one African country to, to the other. So what if, what if we de develop our, our waterways? You know, I was recently in Brazzaville um, and to get from DRC Congo to Brazzaville in itself, which is literally, you can see it. I mean, you could almost swim it if it weren't for, you know, nasty things in the water. Um, you know, it, you, 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 you can't because the, the water connection is not really developed. So we do need to do a lot with that in, in, in intra-development as well. But I think also as we talk about this growth of the economy and, and, and you know, expanding our economies, it is absolutely critical that we're able to connect better with the rest of the world. Um, my Lord, Lord Karen, oh, thank over you. to you. Thank you very much, Eddie. And a pleasure to be with all of you here today. And uh, just putting a bit of historical context to this, uh, my grandfather's, uh, Brigadier Belamoya's cousin, was Admiral Kausichi, who was the chief of the Indian Navy. And my great aunt was a Wadia, and the Wadia family built ships for the British Navy. And the oldest ship afloat outside America 
the whole of the rest of the world is a, a ship called HMS Trincomalee, built by the Wadiyas in India 200 years ago. And it is afloat in Hartlepool in northeast England. And I went on board that ship when it was near Portsmouth, afloat there as a boy with my great aunt. And recently I went back on board that boat, built by Zoroastrian Parsis here in India, still afloat 200 years ago, 200 years later, made out of teak. And it's a proper Battle of Trafalgar type warship built just after the Battle of Trafalgar. So this is the history that we have between the UK and India when it comes to shipbuilding that the minister spoke about earlier and India's ambitions of shipbuilding. In the UK, our armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, the senior service is not the Army. It is the Royal Navy. That is the respect that is given to shipping and the Navy. And I'm a board member of the International Chamber of Commerce in the UK, and I'm about to take over as the chair of the ICC UK, and we promote trade. And if you look at trade flows around the world, it's amazing how it can increase substantially just within a year. I looked at a map recently of world trade flows, and you see the increase between certain parts of the world, and you see the change depending on policies. So who knows what's going to happen next year when it comes to trade flows around the world based on America's uh, tariffs. Inter-Asia trade is growing very, very rapidly between including China and Southeast Asia. India's trade flows and goods are growing phenomenally when you look at this map across the world. And the other area that we're looking at with the ICC is digital trade. Do you know that in the European Union to this day, only one to two percent of the trade is digital. The rest of it is billions and billions of pieces of paper. Now, come on, surely by now we should be moving to digital trade around the world. And the proof is in the UK, we're moving to it. The efficiency improves multifold, the time saved, the money saved, the speed at which you can conclude transactions. So we're promoting that. India has expertise when it comes to fraud and security in trade that we can all learn from. And then when you look at India's container ports, and I'm very happy that Chairman of Jain Jawaharlal Nehru Port in Mumbai is here. I had the privilege of leading a parliamentary delegation from the UK, and we visited your very impressive port. And the way in which you have partnered with different countries my only embarrassment is that the UK should be one of the partners, and we are not. And I'm pushing my government to make sure that we are at your port as a partner in your port. And when it comes to uh, shipbuilding, the way things change, the UK, Glasgow, used to be the shipbuilding headquarters in the world. The expertise, the academic expertise, Glasgow University shipbuilding architecture expertise, it was a cluster. Doesn't exist anymore. Things move on. And finally, when it comes to Europe, Africa, India, which we will discuss in, in, more, in, in more detail, I want you to just conclude with this. I was president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, the equivalent of the CII here in India for two years in 2020, 2022, including during the start of the Ukraine war. And do you know, soon after the war started in May 2020. I attended the B7 before the G7 to represent the UK in Berlin. And the biggest problem we had at that time was that no grain was flowing from Ukraine because there were, the Ukrainian ports have been taken over by Russia except for the port of Odessa. And the grain could flow from Odessa, but the Odessa port was blocked. And the head of the UN food program said, if that port is not unblocked, millions, tens of millions of people will starve around the world. And we made a concerted effort, including across the table to Olaf Scholz at that meeting, I said, you've got the opportunity now to resolve this. And thankfully, with the help 
of the G7, the United Nations, Turkey, and Russia, that port was opened up and those people didn't starve. So that is how crucial and important shipping and ports and trade is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. You, you really, you spoke there to my heart. You spoke to my raison d'etre, which is people. Um, you spoke to people's lives and the fact that people were going to starve. Um, I, I, the head then of the World Food Program, good friend of mine, David, um, yes, um, I, I work very closely with David in, in dealing with the northeast of Nigeria when we were facing famine. And I know that much of the grain and much of the food in those days was coming from Ukraine. Um, so it's important that you, we, we've spoken not just to trade, but we also speak to people because we speak about these things as though it's abstract. We speak as though we're trying to just build, um, economies and build nations, forgetting that there are actually human beings. This is about people. And I'm going to come back to you, um, Umesh, about, about that in a, uh, in a bit. But before that, I'm going to go back to, um, um, sorry, um, Umesh, you're Anusha. I'm going to go back to um, the chairman of the Mumbai Port Authority, Mumbai Nehru Port Authority in Mumbai. And first of all, I want to say I am so heartbroken that we're not in Mumbai. So I hope that next year we will be with you in Mumbai so that we can actually come and visit the port. I was in Mumbai just last month and was so blown away by the infrastructure development and looking at some of the ports um, sort of infrastructure. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's very heartening to meet Lord Karan again. He visited Jain Port last year, April, and with his MP colleagues. As AD told that uh, she saw a lot of infrastructure in Mumbai and Mumbai is definitely undergoing a lot of infrastructural work and lot many infrastructure come up and much more is also planned and much more in pipeline. Coming back to the subject, India and Africa, we share a common past, colonial past. We are also having the common social issues the population and all other things. So we want to partner with Africa in uh, port sector, in logistic sector. Africa also has more than 26,000 kilometer of coast. They have 100 odd ports. But the major issue with Africa is the intra-Africa trade is not much. And I just mentioned here that in India, our largest partner, the China and UAE, they are Asian countries. So to have this intra-Africa trade, India would like to partner with Africa. And our government's vision is very straightforward and simple, that we want to partner with Africa. We want that our industries should go there and set up factories in Africa so that the raw material should be used to manufacture value-added products, which will be sold in the Africa continent, and also if there is a surplus to the other countries. So it should not be the, the colonial kind of setup that where we require the raw materials from Africa, and then we want to process it in our country and then send as a market to the Africa. That kind of set setup we don't want and India is partnering with Africa to give one example last year when the Honorable President of Tanzania was in India in the presence of our Honorable Prime Minister uh, uh, India and uh, Tanzania signed one agreement where it is decided that the Jawaharlal Nehru Port Authority uh, set up one free trade zone in Tanzania so that the Indian industrialists and industrialists from all over the world can set up their factories there. So this kind of infrastructure development with partnering with the African country is envisaged in India's policy towards Africa. 
we would also like to share our experience because in last decade we have done lot many efforts in the infrastructure and logistic sector specially related to port and certain programs which are very successful one of that is the sagar mala another is the bharat mala then pm gati shakti then national logistic uh, policy all these programs our experience we want to share with africa and partner with them so that mutually we could do certain things for the mutual benefit thank you very much um umesh um you talk about partnering and you talk about our colonial past which is interesting um because and and i i like to think of life in bridges and it's really interesting to have my lord here who literally bridges that colonial past and the present um in in many ways and i loved what you also said about the history and the fact that you know that ship that your family was involved with building now sits um a battleship which sits sits there in in the uk there is much in the past that we sometimes repudiate but i think also we must learn from the past and we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater you know we must we must embrace what 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 was good from it and we must you know learn and 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 reshape that which didn't work i think part of what in many ways that past has done i i i speak as an african um who also lives in fiji so i must bring the pacific into this conversation you know i speak as an african is that you know we have been divided in many ways you know we have been weaponized one against the other we have been you know it's we've been the, the the world or maybe those that some powers that be have 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 pitched us one against the other but indeed you're right we have common challenges we have common issues we have common cultures in many way ways you know whenever i come to india i'm stunned by you know, i was in in pune recently and i went to meet um the chair, chairman of um serum institute uncle cyrus and as i greeted uncle cyrus he said but you're like an indian he said you know you call uncle your cultures are the same we are very similar in in many ways and you know if if nothing else you know and i want to thank orf and and samir and 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 my friends here for for ensuring that we're bringing and i i mean prime minister um modi the honorable prime minister was just in abuja nigeria two days ago three days ago and he said this he talked about you know bringing us all together and talked about the fact that our, our similarities there is more that brings us together than that which keeps us apart and these these connections and being on joint platforms are a really critical thing to ensure that we learn from that colonial past we don't repudiate it but we build upon the lessons of the past having said that i'm going to actually go, go very quickly back to to kenya since we don't have Tanzania in the room and go back to you to to respond almost to that reach out he, he, for partnership how do we lean into that how do we lean into the partnership offer how do we in africa connect with our brothers and sisters here on the indian subcontinent uh thank you very much for that question i uh the intervention i want to make is that uh, there are many ways in which we can link up first and foremost we are grateful that uh during the presidency of uh, g20 uh, india's presidency of g20 is when we were admitted as african union although we think soon we should uh, move away from that because african union is not one country we are 54 african countries but we appreciate that the indian prime minister who is a big friend of the african continent was able to push for that during his presidency of uh, the g20 now india as we normally say uh, here in the indian ocean is uh, like a big brother although one of the indian generals was telling me but we are a big brother who doesn't want to lord over you and which is a good thing so uh we are open to uh, strengthening the collaboration between us and india uh, because it is very, it is mutually beneficial to both india and african countries individual and collectively uh, for us to have that partnership in all the areas whether it is trade uh, skills development uh, technology transfer 
uh, mention, to mention but a few of the areas, even healthcare. As you know, most of our, our citizens come to India uh, to see Indian doctors and get, to get treatment. And so that is something that we are open to. We are willing to work with them. And just to respond to what was said earlier on, to connect Africa, uh, like for example, you talked of DRC, uh, we can learn from India, India's program on inland waterways. Because like DRC has a very large navigable river, the Congo River. There are many land-linked African countries that have big rivers and also lakes. And so if we can be able to develop inland water transport in those countries, uh, maybe borrow from India, they've been doing it, as the minister said, then we'll be able to open up the interland of Africa uh, for trade and uh, also for free movement of people. And, and, and so that is one of the things I wanted to say. But within Africa already, there is a conversation going on uh, for, for the countries to be linked from the east, where we are, to the west, uh, with, with the road network, with the rail network, so that we open up the art of Africa. And so Indian companies have an opportunity, because India is a subcontinent, uh, which is very big and so and geographically diverse. They have an opportunity of working with individual African governments in ensuring that we develop the necessary infrastructure that is needed to open up the interland of Africa. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jeffrey. That's very well said. Indeed, um, it was India's presidency of the G20, and I had the privilege of being here for much of it last year, that really pushed hard for the Africa Union um, to, to become a formal member of, so it's now the G21. We should actually be calling it now, not the G20. I had the privilege of, of, of taking the Africa seat um, during many of those meetings last year. I was a representative of Africa um, all over India and, and, and saw how keenly uh, um, India pushed for us to become a member. It is now for us to lean into that and truly occupy that space. As you talk about intra-Africa trade, let's now talk about, you know, trade, sort of how Africa is, 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 is an India, you know, the sort of, I'm going to go to the social um, very quickly because, I mean, Lord Car um, Karen brought up the, the whole issue of food and, and how people were affected when ports were closed. I mean, we saw that during COVID um, as well, not just with war, we saw during COVID, you know, what the slowdown in trade and even when, do you all remember when that ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, what it did? To, to global trade flows. Um, so, but how it affects people is why I want to come to you now. Thanks, Yodi, and I'll stick to the time. Um, so I think port cities are, uh, they're contributing to close to 55%, 60% of trade, and that's a non figure. As we look at JNPT, it's like 6 million TUs, and there's Port of Durban, and uh, you know, all of those which are contributing to a lot of TU. But I think the most important challenge uh, in the whole blue economy ecosystem is to ensure that these benefits are shared uh, inclusively and equally. I think that's the biggest challenge that we are facing. Yeah, and I think for that, uh, a few important factors that we can set thought leadership for would be job creation, uh, skill development. And apart from that, while we look at environmental indicators, uh, when port cities are being developed, I think a very important aspect of that will be social impact assessment. Uh, because that is something that is always brought in later. So probably at the planning stage, if we could also look at having social impact assessment indicators, which are set at global standards when we look at uh, you know, sustainable goals, I think that is going to be really, really critical. Um, and it's possible because we have uh, uh, the port of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. They're, they're doing, uh, you know, they're employing 5,000 local artisans already within the blue economy system. Uh, there's Kandla in Gujarat, there's Cochin, there's Chennai. They're already doing a lot of local community-based involvement uh, during, uh, you know, at the planning stage for port development. So I think that will be very critical. Uh, apart from that, uh, another um, uh, aspect and probably the most important one would also be to engage in a sister city engagement. Probably port cities can partner through collaborative frameworks 
and see how we can share knowledge, how we can share expertise to involve people. Thank you very much, Anusha. You, I love it. I love actionable things. So you've proposed a, an actionable thing. You've proposed sister cities and um, you've talked about the linkage with people. Um, I believe we have Ambassador John now. So if somebody can get him a mic, because I really want to hear, since this is talking about the African, you know, the linkages between Africa and, and, and India, um, we heard about the African, where is Ambassador John? We heard about the African, um, um, free continental trade area and we also heard about the free the the zone in tanzania ambassador john olanga now th thanks sir. and i'm sorry i stepped out when you called me earlier uh, maybe more probably the rather than a contribution is the question i think it's important uh, this conversation that we talk about increased ocean connectivity between africa asia uh, and europe but I had a thought, especially because of the potential for the African uh, continental free trade area. Uh, and yesterday we talked about, I think someone's talked about uh, Indian flagged, Indian owned ships. But how many, and especially to my brother from Kenya, how many countries in Africa own ships? And if you talk about AFCFTA, the African continental free trade area, one of the big, biggest bottlenecks is transport, and uh, not only inland transport, but also ocean transport. So I'm we seeing a huge opportunity for increased investment in shipping lines in Africa to connect Africa, and through connecting Africa, I think it will, it will make it even easier to connect Africa to the rest of the world. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador John. Another practical suggestion, excellent, um, excellent. There are another, other questions. Um, I would like you to please, you, there's a couple of mics. I'm going to take a couple of questions um, from the floor. I see a hand up there. If you can just head to the, the nearest mic, it's easier. Thank you. There's somebody at a mic already, over to you. Thank you. My name is uh, Peter Tony Setchel, the Vice President of the uh, First Nation Chamber of Commerce in South Africa. Now, this, with respect, is but a humble suggestion uh, going forward. It is common cause that uh, the globe has become smaller. Smaller in the sense that it is interconnected. And Europe, India, and Asia have inevitably uh, realized that the global south is not the far off long lost cousin of yesteryear, but a crucial player in world markets, in investment, in maritime connectivity and sustainability. Now, this realization is noble, and I have to applaud the Indian government, uh, the ORF, and everybody who made this esteemed conference uh, such a glowing success that it is. However, I could elaborate on the role of the rest of Africa in this multi-model corridor of trade and development, but allow me rather to put my hand in my own South African bosom and state what the thorny lived experiences are of our people. My beloved South Africa is a country drowning in crippling corruption at the moment on all levels of government and the private sector with no or very little uh, accountability and action from law enforcement agencies. And uh, all these efforts, noble efforts being discussed during this conference could come to naught in my country if uh, your good selves are not circumspect about with whom and how you deal with entities, individuals, and institutions in my country. But we all know, and that's a fact, that corruption eats away, it erodes the social, ethical, moral, judicial, and legal fabric of, of a country. Now that is the South African reality. It is respectfully uh, 
in this light that I humbly submit that future conferences of this nature and magnitude must include on their agendas uh, discussions on legislative and regulatory systems and procedures of the state parties and the participants and exclude those entities implicated in wrongdoing despite the internal law enforcement agencies uh, not acting against them. In effect, I implore you to adopt a zero tolerance approach to corruption and that way the goals of this conference shall become a glowing success. I thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your, for your suggestion. Um, over to the next, do we have anybody at the next mic? Yeah, that's me, please. Yes, please. Uh, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, absolutely delighted by the insightful uh, conversations that you've had in the course of the last 45 minutes. My name is Deepak Shetty. I was a former career civil servant in the government of India. I retired as secretary in the government of India, also served as director general of shipping for a couple of years. Um, I'm completely, I echo the sentiments which all of you articulated. I'm equally gung-ho in terms of the exponential potential for all the connectivity and the the trade volumes that could grow. But I just wanted to draw your kind attention and I do not wish to be sounding very disparaging. I hope my apologies if I do come across, but this is just a ground reality check that I just wanted to put it across. Having seen this empirically in terms of what awaits certain pockets in the African continent for the merchant shipping sector in particular, both in the West African and the East African corridors, and what I'm referring to is armed robbery, piracy and terrorism. Hugely disruptive forces, which at a given point of time, they were rampantly prevalent. But dare I say that probably unless there is a fix on the land or the shore side, and if somebody doesn't get a handle on that, I think that will continue to plague the minds of the merchant shipping sector. And more importantly, the seafarers who man the merchant ships in terms of what is going to be otherwise deemed to be a fairly seamless connectivity. So just wanted to invite attention to some of these moles and warts, as it were, that are prevalent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to remind us that this is a conference that is looking forward. And I want to remind us that whilst we recognize that there are challenges, I want to also remind us that we are trying to talk about positivity and how to overcome those challenges. And so whilst we recognize the challenges, let us not allow those challenges to be the driving, the, the take home message. Lord Karen. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because yes. if I had been asked to come in again, um, I was going to bring this point up. And I just want to say a couple of things because we're running out of time. I want to applaud Prime Minister Modi and India because I represented the Confederation of British Industries, the B20 and the G20 last year. It is India as the head of the G20 that brought in the African Union to join the G20. And I think it was fantastic. And I think that when we're talking about ports and when we're talking about shipping, we are talking about more and more being multilateral, about promoting free trade, about promoting the environment. And my dear friend, President Nasheed is over here, and I chaired the Maldives All Party Parliamentary Group. We still charge duty in the UK on Maldive tuna. And the tuna in the Maldives is fished using line fishing, not using nets, in fished in as environmental a way as possible, and yet we're starting the duty. We should not be charging that duty at all. And trade and security go hand in hand. The former secretary made this point. Today, trade is disrupted in a big way through BAM and the Straits of Hormuz. Many, many ships are not going through the Suez Canal because they're worried about being attacked. That should not happen. And this is where we need to work together and where the navies of our world come together. And the Indian Navy, the UK Navy, two very powerful navies, should be working together to make sure that ships are, sh are safe from piracy and from terrorists. And you're absolutely right to bring up that point. Thank you very much. The environment. We have not spoken much about the environment. The person speaking about photography earlier on mentioned biodiversity. At my university, Cambridge University in the UK, Professor Sapartha Dasgupta, 
Indian professor, has written a report on the economics of biodiversity. And he says there are one million species on this planet that are a threat of extinction. And nature is our most precious asset. And I love scuba diving, and I go scuba diving around the world. And I tell you, when I go to a spot again, I can see underwater the difference if you've had the effect of climate change and the erosion of our biodiversity. So multilateral trade, trade and security, and the environment, those are things we've got to focus on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Karen. Um, Robert, as Robert is coming up, I want to say that what you said about the environment is particularly pertinent, given what we're experiencing in Delhi this week. Um, you know, as we talk about climate change and as our other colleagues are at COP29 in Baku, you know, the effects of climate change, the effects on the environment, the effects of pollution are really, really beginning to show their hand. I was shocked when I got off the plane yesterday morning because I literally couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And this is a real issue. And um, over to you, Robert. Um, I, I'll finish that thought later. later. Sorry, um, not Robert. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to <clears throat> give thanks to the Research Foundation and the Ministry of Partnership and Human Waterways of organizing this conference in India. It is time that we, India is in these discussions in a proactive way. It's a, a very important actor to change the balance. And I bring attention to one important event that is going to be, uh, happen next year. The UN, United Nations Ocean Conference in Nice, France in 2025. India must be heard its voice in there. It cannot be silent. And when you compare India to China, you know what is geography. China is a rim line, but also is surrounded. Many neighbors and is constrained by that. But India has an open ocean of its own. And that's a big difference. Take that advantage and you should and if you do it sustainably, then you could say the future is now and we can build a better world together in a prosper way with equal benefits and more equal benefits to everyone. And you can come with Portugal for that also. Thank you very much, Ruben. Over to you, Jeffrey, for one last word. Uh, we're running out of time, and I know there's a break afterwards, um, but we have just one last word from, from my final panelist. No, he, I've already asked, he said no. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think I'm very grateful for the feedback that we're getting from the floor. <laughs> I just want to add uh, one or two things. One is I completely agree with the Lord my lord here that uh, we have to strengthen our security partnership within the Indian Ocean and so the EU uh, countries together with India and African countries must work together to ensure that our seas are safe and secure. And then secondly, uh, I want to thank Ambassador John for bringing up the issue of uh, uh, ship ownership. Actually, as the minister, the honorable minister was speaking about India becoming among the top five shipbuilding nations, I think uh, do not forget that uh, we also want to play in that league at some point. And so there's an opportunity for shipbuilding, ship repair, and also ship recycling. Uh, we dispose vessels under the Hong Kong Convention, which are no longer seaworthy. And, and so India, and together, together with the other countries, uh, can work with African nations in ensuring that we achieve the objective of uh, strengthening shipbuilding and ship recycling and repair. Finally, on the issue of corruption, which my brother from South Africa talked about, yes, indeed, we must have policy, institutional and legal reforms uh, that will govern any resources that will be spent on mega projects in our continent and in other parts of the world. So corruption has been a problem, but we have to tackle it head on. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
Thank you very, very much. Um, and as I wrap up this session, thank you all to my esteemed panelists. You all have done an incredible job of educating me, um, not to talk about everybody else here. We live in a world of polycrisis. We live in a world that is beset by conflict, by climate, by many, many things. We, in my field, we deal with health crises. We deal with emerging, emerging, emerging pandemics. Um, but we have to look to the future. We have to look at the bridges, the things that connect us, um, move away from those that divide us. As we talked about, uh, my lord, and many of you referred to security and, and, and terrorism, we see it all over the world. We see wars around the world. But we must not focus on the negative. Whilst we deal with the negative, we must focus on the way forward. The way forward is the rising, the rising south. The way forward are, is the partnerships that we all have. The way forward is developing new frontiers, developing new economic models, developing the digital world. As we heard, we are killing the planet with all the paper. And the paper, and as you talked about, trade is on paper. The paper does not give us accountability because you can hide bits of paper. But when it is digital, it brings transparency and it sheds light. So this panel has been incredible. We have talked about the social effects. We've talked not enough about the effects potentially of shipping and the inclusion of women and girls in shipping. We have heard the offer from India to partner with Africa. We've heard about the European Green Channel, and we've heard a lot about um, what is going on globally and also from the UK and the historical nature of the partnerships in shipping, also e even in a personal way. So with that, I want to thank my panel. Um, Tanubi is standing there, small but mighty. Um, <laughs> she's terrifying. Um, she's given me already seven, nine extra minutes, um, but I I want to say thank you very much to the panel for a great discussion. We will co continue the conversations in, over coffee. I invite you to join them outside and to chat with them and to ask various questions. Thank you very much for listening. Over thank to you. you to